cares about that. Feels our pain, feels our hurts, and is always there for us. You know, I always pray and I ask the Lord, what is it that he wants me to sing? Because I'm not singing about me or for glorification or anything like that. I'm singing for his glorification and to touch lives for him. And the Spirit impressed upon my heart that uh, as we're going through these trials and tribulations in our life, somebody just needs to know that he feels your pain, he feels your hurts, and he's with you. And he knows best. Sometimes we don't think that what we're going through is best for us, but he knows best. So this song is just God knows best. That's the right one. From the time I was a little child, I've always heard of you. And I've seen with my own eyes the wondrous things that you could do. But in spite of all I've seen and heard, still this question came to me. Why must so if God knows what is best for me. As my nights and days turned into months, and the months turned into years, I could see my trust turn into God. was best for me. So with everything within me, I say yes to be your Lord. Even though my faith is weak, I'm standing on your word. So forgive me, Lord, for ways I cannot see. Now I must assure that you know what is best 
that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken. Now we're skipping over to the book of James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 27. James chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse number 27. Say amen if you're there. James chapter 1. In verse number 27. The Bible says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the fatherless. Excuse me, the father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much, dear God, that you've given us the privilege to study your word together today. And Lord, I don't have anything of myself that I can really share. So I'm just asking that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, hide me behind the cross, and speak through me words of life. And somebody, Lord, in darkness can find hope, and light, and, some, and, some, uh, and, a, and a way out. Lord, speak through me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You all can be seated. I get, uh, I get a magazine from the Southern Union, which some of you all probably get too. The Southern Tidings. Anybody got to get the Southern Tidings? Great magazine, uh, good stuff. It keeps you abreast of all the different things that are taking place throughout the Southern Union of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And one of the things that actually is interesting to note is the obituaries. At the towards the back of the Southern Tidings, and it gives the list of people who have passed away. In fact, this past Southern Tidings, my wife brought it to me actually, uh, and she shared with me. She showed me in the obituaries that my uh, my aunt's name was there. She lived to be 91. She just died. I think it was two months ago. Went to her funeral. But also one of the things I also like to take note of is those who have lived the longest. 91 is long. But there was somebody who lived even longer. I think there was a person who lived to be 97. There was also a person that lived to be 103 years old. 103 years old. Did you see that one over? His name was Charles Henry Gordon. Now, now I took note of it because, and I'm, this is silly, but it's true. I'm pretty sure it was a black man. And the reason I'm sure it was a black man was not because of his name, but, but because of the name of, I think it was his great-grandchildren. It was something like... Uh, some, one of them, you know, one, you know one of them names, <laughs> one of them names like Shariza or, some, you know, Shantae or one of those, like, okay, this is definitely not, an, or one of our Anglo brothers, more than likely, it's one of, you know, it's one of the African American brothers. He lived to be 103 years old. 103 years old. Old, which is a blessing to God be the glory. So when I actually hear about somebody living to be 103 years old, I'm actually my, my, my interest is peaked. So I begin to actually read uh, the bio, bio on this particular gentleman. And one of the things I took note of was it's interesting. First of all, the guy was still going to the gym. The guy was still going to the gym. He was still working. Can you imagine a guy working out up into their 90s? And you know, actually, if you go on YouTube, I think there's this lady. I think she's in her 90s. She's a bodybuilder. She's actually lifting weights. And there's this one um, African-American lady. I think she's in her 80s. That lady will beat most people in push-ups. You know what I'm talking about. I think she's from Baltimore. You know, I'm telling you what, friends. You, ought to, you, 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 don't, you don't want to mess with this sister. If you are actually in the alleyway, you need to run. <laughs> she might be 80, but she might actually... Anyway, so, so, so what I'm saying is, is that this brother, he was still going to the gym up in, I think probably up into his 90s. His mind was still sharp. Obviously, you know, uh, age takes its toll, so finally you break down. But what, another thing I noticed was what they also said about him. And listen to the, the words of, uh, of what they said about him. It says, he held... Now listen to this. He held a respect and love for family that extended to all of his relatives. He held, he held a respect and love for family that extended to all his relatives. 
He enjoyed spending time with and giving orders to his grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. And they enjoyed spending time with him and saying, yes, sir. Isn't that interesting? Which meant that up until probably the day he died, he had their respect. Amen. You know, I think the reason he had their respect, now hear me now, especially talking to our men, is because he was there. Amen. Amen. He was there. You know, you know what's interesting? You know what's in it's so interesting? Is that um, you, you wonder, what is it, especially for African Americans, probably what is the black man's worst enemy? You know, actually, I go to the, we go to the prisons, and, you know, actually 40%, we only make up 12% of the population, but we make up 40% of the prison population. Isn't that sad? So you almost think, is that, is that the black man's worst enemy? Is it the jail system? I mean, it's pretty bad, don't get me wrong, it's terrible. Or, or better yet, is it lack of education? You know, actually, uh, you know, they always say, the old saying, it's a bad saying, but especially for Af African Americans, they say, if you want to hide something from a black man, you put it where? In a book. <laughs> and you wonder to yourself, is lack of education the thing above everything else that is destroying, especially African American communities, but communities across the board? Better yet, you ask yourself, what about financial our, our, our financial struggles. Do you realize that America actually, do you know that 33% of all black families have a net income of, or excuse me, a net worth of, of less than zero? Did you know that? And you want to know what the average net worth of black families is in America? Anyone want to take a guess what the average net worth of a black family in America is? You know, want, to, want to take a guess? You're going to say 17,000. 17,000 going once, 17,000. You said, somebody said negative something. Anyone want to take another guess? You said 10, somebody said 20? The, what's that? 15, okay. The, the, the net worth of the average African American family is $4,900. Anyone want to take the net? Anyone want to guess what the net worth of of, a, 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 of our Caucasian counterparts of family is? Anyone want to take a guess? Two hundred thousand. What? Two hundred thousand. What'd you say? You say six? Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, I could, you know, I know. Anybody else? Anybody else want to take a guess? What's that? Forty-seven thousand. Sixty. Sixty thousand. You said eighty. The average net worth of, an Af of, of, of a Caucasian American family is $97,000. So for the black family, it's $4,900. For the Caucasian family, it is $97,000. Is that the worst enemy, especially in the African American community? Is it lack of financial resources? Is it the fact that we have so many people incarcerated? Is it the drug epidemic? Is it, the, is it the fact that drugs are seeping into our communities and they're actually causing so much pain? What is the biggest enemy, especially of African Americans, but what's the biggest enemy of men in general? The biggest enemy of people in general, if you want to actually really know what it is, it's those, their own, the, themselves. Our worst enemy, friends, is not even Satan. Right. Our worst enemy is our own selves. We are self-destructing. We don't like to admit it, friends, but we are self-destructing. And friends, what's so bad is, is that when we self-destruct, we don't just take our own selves down, we take down others with us. I.e. our own children. Because you realize, friends, as a result of self-destructing men, they are destroying, they're destroying children and families. Do you realize that actually, anybody want to guess what the, um, the rate of fatherless homes are? Especially that, anybody want to guess the rate of fatherless homes? Let's start with the, the black community. Anybody, anybody want to guess? A few years ago, it was 66%. In the Hispanic community, it's 42%. 
in the uh, uh, Caucasian community, I believe it's 25%. But overall, friends, a huge portion of America is being raised in single parent homes. And as a result of these children being raised in single parent homes, where most of them are being raised by moms, actually as a result, friends, there has been so much there's been so, so many additions to the problems and heartbreaks that these kids are having to go through. You and I both know that. Kids that are raised without a father are more prone to have even physical problems and mental problems. They're not able to actually, they're, they're known that, they're actually increased drug use, deviant or criminal behavior, low self-esteem, low educational performance, more angry or aggressive tendencies. Why? Because whether they realize it or not, it's almost a cry that's coming from outside of their being saying, where is my dad? Where is my dad? And if you all were honest, there's a huge portion of people even in here who are raised with their father nowhere in sight. Nowhere in sight. And whether they even realize it or not, friends, the conscious or unconscious effects it's actually had on you are unbelievable. So here was Abraham. Here's Abraham in the book of Genesis chapter 18. Go with me back there to the book of Genesis chapter 18. The Bible says, friends, that Abraham was just sitting in his tent door. He was sitting in his tent door and he was just relaxing there when all of a sudden the Bible says he lifted up his eyes and there was these three men. These three men included the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, and two angels. And they began to have a visitation with with Abraham. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained what? Angels unaware. I don't know if he realized it immediately or not, but sooner or later he realized, wow, this is actually God I'm talking to. In fact, God told him, you're going to have a child. I've preached this in other occasions. But it boggles my mind. First of all, the guy was 99 years old. His wife is 89 years old. They're past hopelessness. What the Lord hit me with, friends, listen to this, is that God literally created an egg for Sarah. Had you ever thought about that before? Because the Bible says that she was past the manner of women, which meant that she wasn't actually had no more eggs. God created an egg for this woman so that she could actually give birth to children. But not only that, friends, but finally after they had their long conversation and Sarah finally was actually rebuked for laughing when she should have believed when God said, I'm going to actually visit you next year and you're going to have a child. He said, we're about to go on our merry way. And so the men went on their way. Two of them went on their way. And Abraham stayed there with the Lord. And God said this in verse number 16, verse 16, back, back in Genesis 18. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I what? Do. Am I going to hide it from him? You know, get this. You know, part of the reason that some of us are not really re receiving some deep truths from God it's because God knows that not, we're not, not, this is weird, but we're not raising our families correctly. And so God's not going to reveal to you some, some, some deep truths when you're not even taking care of the family that's right in front of your face. He's like, I'm not going to reveal anything more to you. Y'all don't need to know that. Because you already got some problems at home. Why do you need to be worried about other people's problems when you got some problems at home that you haven't even attended to? You have some unhappy wives and some sad children. You know what? You know what? I'm speaking now as a pastor. This is just real talk, just conversation. And, and I'm not bashing any ministers. Please don't, get, don't misunderstand it. Um, misunderstand it. But many times we praise these ministers that travel all around the world. They baptize tens of thousands of people. But at the same time, their children leave the church and they don't have anything to do with church because while their dad was out there saving the world, he neglected his family. 
And friends, it's not just for the pastors. It's many times for many other men. They're so busy taking care of everybody else that they don't have time to take care of their family. You know your first congregation? You know what your first congregation is? It's your family. And I think, of, I think that if, if, since Noah and his family was saved, I think Noah was far more successful than we give him credit for. Because if he didn't say nobody else but his own children thought my dad is authentic and real and he's sincere and he believes it and he's a serious Christian and I'm going to follow in my father's footsteps, then I actually say more power to Abraham. You are a real Christian. Excuse me. Noah, you're a real Christian. Amen? And the same thing applies to Abraham. Look what the Bible says about Abraham, verse 18. He says, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great na and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, verse 19, for I know him. Does God know you? Does God even know you? I'm not talking about not, I mean, God knows everybody. But when I'm talking about knowing, I'm talking about, the Bible says, and it says, and, uh, Adam knew Eve, and she brought forth what? A child. Does God have a serious, intimate relationship with you? Does he really know you? Can he brag about you? He said, I know Abraham. Because we've been actually having conversations for years now. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. I know what he's going to do. I don't know about anybody else, but I can brag about Abraham. He's going to take care of his family. He's going to command his children and his household after him. And get what this is actually saying, friends. This is saying that for Abraham, he was more concerned simply not just with his own children, but everybody is in, in his entire household. That meant that everybody, everybody that was actually employed by him, his servants and their children, he felt it was his responsibility to make sure that those people were living godly Christian lives. And as long as they were in his house, he was like Joshua in, in, in saying, as for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. I, what I love about this guy who would be 103 years old is that, friends, he was respected by everybody in the entire family. Have you ever actually had those people that, and it's, it's kind of bad, but when I, you know, when I was young, I had certain people, it, 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 it was bad, but it was good. I knew that if I went to their house, they were going to give me a sermon. You, anybody know what I'm talking about? Those grandmas? And, and it actually, it almost sometimes got on your nerves, especially if you weren't doing what you should be doing. Because you knew that if you got to their house, hey, Grandma, how you doing? Hey, how you, you love Jesus? I do, I love Jesus. You know, Jesus is coming soon, amen? You love him? And you need, to, you, need, you need to get your house in order, and you need, boy, such and such, and, 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 and at first, and, and you would enjoy it, but then after all, it's like, oh, man. Because if you didn't, get me now, hear me now. Because if you weren't going to get no Jesus anywhere else, you were going to get some Jesus at Grandma's house. Or you are going to get some Jesus at Uncle what, whatever's house. You know what I'm talking about? There, there's that person who, if you, were, if you didn't go nowhere else, you are going to get a sermon from them. Amen? Sister Young is like that. I think Sister Young is one of them. Somebody knows. Okay, well, look at all the hands shaking. The heads are shaking. Sister Young, that's why sometimes they're not always visiting like they should. Because they know they're going to get a good sermon. They're going to get some Jesus. Amen? He said, I know Abraham. He's going to command his children and his household. Which meant, friends, that they, he, it wasn't just his own son Isaac who was going to get preached to. It was Eliezer and his children. It was all the other servants and their children. Everybody was going to get some Jesus. If you came near me, you were going to actually get fed some Jesus. Amen? Amen. Part of the reason we were actually talking about this in prayer meeting, that we need to be praying for our community in Pensacola, Florida. Amen? Amen? Do you realize that actually part of the reason our community is so messed up is because we don't take an interest in the young people, especially as men. Abraham didn't just take an interest in his own children, but his household. Pure religion and undefiled before God is to visit the what? Fatherless. Perhaps God 
do that in the last days of this his, of, of world's history, one of the biggest issues that was going to be destroying our communities is the fact that there's a lack of fathers all over the place. And friends, you know who I, I blame for, the, for, for a whole lot of the problems in our society? I don't solely blame those fathers that weren't there. You know who else I blame? I blame a church that should be there like Abraham, but said, no, that's not my problem. That's not my problem. I got my children, my, my children okay. You can take care of your own kids. <laughs> I, I, I never will forget. I never will forget. I'm just talking. This is just real talk. We're not gonna land, I'm going to land soon. It was a few years ago. I, was, um, I guess me and my wife were still dating. I believe I was up at Andrews. And I saw on the computer screen, Korean guy shoots 31 people at Virginia Tech. you remember that? Virginia Tech University. It just out of the blue. And then he sent that video up to, I think it was NBC up in New York City. Isn't that, isn't that how, how it went? You remember that? Y'all remember that? Do you know what actually happened after that? The president of Korea, hear me now, the president of Korea apologized for what this Korean boy did. And yet the president of Korea probably never even met that young man. But in his mind, he felt, he felt like if, they, if, they, if, if that Korean person did that, that's going to reflect on the entire what? Family of Koreans. Do you realize, and can I talk now, and almost everybody is, is, is African American. Can we, can we talk? I'm, I'm copying what the preacher said last week. Can we talk? And I'm just, can I be real with you? I'm just trying to be as real as possible. I gotta stop. But I'm, 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 this is bad, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be transparent. This is very bad. You said I'm on camera. <laughs> this is bad. This is bad, but I'm just gonna be transparent. You know, you hear about these mass shootings and stuff like that. And about how somebody went to some place and took the lives of all those people. First of all, I think it's horrific. I think it's terrible. Terribly terrible. But at the same time, I, I, <laughs> he, he said, I, I'm like, please, Lord, don't let his name be Lorenzo. <laughs> don't let it be Tyrone. I, don't let it be anybody. But what, my point, you, you get my point, you get my point. Somebody got my point. So, see, you see, we've got to actually see, we've got to see, we've got to see our, everybody in our community is what? Is a part of our household. And their, their, their welfare is what? Our welfare. If something happens to one, it happens to what? To all, amen? And you've got to actually make, make it up in your mind. I'm talking especially to our brothers, but also to our sisters as well. That, you know what? When that other young person is, is doing those terrible crimes, that actually sometimes can actually be traced back to a neglect on somebody in the church's part to administer to that person. You, whoever is in your purview, is that the word purview? Whoever is in your purview, you ought to consider, consider them to be a part of your, of your household. Amen. And say, you know what? I'm going to do all that I can to minister to that young person or that young lady to keep them from t making some terrible, terrible mistakes. Many a young lady. Because she has a father that's not there. <clears throat> Goes out there and gets a baby out of wedlock. Because she's searching for that man to tell her the stuff that her father never told her. Hmm. Many a young man, because his father is in a prison cell, the only mentor he has is a person in a prison cell, and all the other men in the, in the community are in a prison cell. So guess what? His, his, his main aspiration is to be nothing but a criminal also. 
So you have many times cycles and cycles of men in prison. Father and son and grandson. Or better yet, or better yet, right roaming the streets, you have the father a drug dealer. The son a drug dealer. The grandson of what? A drug dealer. And the cycle continues somewhere along there, friends. We've got to make it up in our minds. Lord, by the, by the power of Jesus Christ, we're going to break that cycle. And somebody has to get tired. Anybody tired? I'm tired of seeing fatherless homes. I'm tired of children growing up saying, where is my daddy? I never will forget, I was at this church, this little girl, prayer meeting. This little girl, prayer meeting. She didn't even know who her father was. Eight, seven, eight years old. We were praying a prayer. And as we were praying our prayer, this little girl said, Lord, and bless my <coughs> father. Bless my daddy. The cry of the heart of so many people is for our father. That's why the Bible says these words as we're about to land in the book of John. Go with me to the book of John. The book of John. You see, friends, the good news of the Bible, the goodness of the Word of God is, is that God has a remedy for every problem. The book of John, chapter 20. John, the 20th chapter. God has a remedy for every problem. John, chapter 20, verse number 16. Here was Mary. She was crying. And she was crying because she didn't know exactly where Jesus was. They've taken away my Lord's body, and I don't know where they've laid it at. Where is it at? Until Jesus said these words in John chapter 20, verse 16. Jesus said unto her, what did he say? He said, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, for body, which is to say, Master, verse 17. Jesus said unto her, touch me not. Don't touch me. Touch me not. You can play. You can play. Touch me not. For I have not yet ascended to my what? Now notice, if you call him, he's my father. I've got a dad. But then look what he goes on to say. But go to my brother. And what did he call him? Brother. You see, friends, when you actually, when you accept Christ, you're adopted into a family. Amen? Amen. So if you don't have a family down here, you've got a family of brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus right here in this church. Amen? Amen. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And he says, go unto my brethren. And what did he say? And say unto them, I ascend unto what? My father. And whose father? You've got a father. Amen? You've got a father who loves you. He's, he's a father who's going to be with you until the very end of time. He says, Lo, I'm with you unto the what? End of the world. So if your earthly father forsakes you, you've got a father in heaven who always will be there. He always cares for you. He always loves you. He'll keep you very close by his side. The Bible says, Go unto, my, uh, unto them and say, I said unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. You've got a father who cares. You've got a father who's going to be there no matter what. You can, you can play, you can play. I was... I was up at camp meeting. And at camp meeting every year is a time to, you know, meet with friends and family. So I got a chance to see so many of the other ministers. I got a chance to see all the people at churches, and many of the people at churches I used to pastor at. I got a chance to see some of the people that I even grew up with back in Kentucky. I got a chance to see Stephen <laughs> and his wife, Sister Charday, and the Hawkins, and so many. It was, it was a wonderful time. But as great as it was to see all those people, one of the greatest things I enjoy about going to camp meeting for is because at the South Central, Company, uh, South Central Conference camp meeting, I get a chance to see my dad. 
People say I look like my dad. He said, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I'm so thankful that from the time I was born until now, I don't think my dad is perfect because nobody's perfect. But I can say without a shadow of a doubt that to me, next to God, <coughs> he's been the greatest in my, in, my, in my mom, he's been the greatest influence on my life. I'm so thankful to have a dad who loves me. He's always been there. And in God, we've got somebody who's even greater than that. So every head's bowed, every eye's closed. The Bible said, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. There's a whole lot of fatherless children out here. There's a whole lot of kids who are longing for a daddy. And God's called the church to be his representatives. Men, I'm inviting, you know, this is one of those practical appeals. Men, I'm inviting you as men to be a big brother to somebody. Ask the Lord, Lord, lead me to somebody that I can actually help be a, 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 a almost like a father figure to. I heard Barry Black tell a story about a mother figure in his life, this old woman. And when she was being funeralized, he was at the funeral. And somebody asked the question, they said, how is it that this famous synod chaplain was at this funeral for this little woman? And hear what he said. He turned around and he went to those people and he said, look, there would be no Chaplain Black if there was not this woman. Do you realize that you as men, I'm talking to especially our men, but also our ladies too, you might be the very catalyst to make a young man become all that God's called him to be. Some man might become president because of you taking some time. That, what that scripture is saying is take some time out of your busy schedule. I know you got all these other things to do. But like Abraham, who God knew, take some time out of your schedule and say, I'm going to be a father to the fathers. I'm going to visit some widow whose husband's not there. Or maybe he left the being a rolling stone. And I'm just going to actually help to minister to those young people. And it's not just by simply visiting them, friends. It's by helping them when they're in need. God needs us to be his hands, to be his feet. As Dr. King said, if I can help somebody as I travel along, if I can cheer someone with a word or song, if I can show someone when they're traveling wrong, then my living would not be in vain. Every head's bowed, every eyes closed. So about some young man wants to say, Lord, I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing to be a mentor. I'm willing to be a big brother. I'm willing to be a father for somebody. That's you. I want you to stand to your feet. If you want to say, Lord, I'm, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to actually help to stand in the gap for those young people who have no father there. And all around us, I'm sure you know somebody. I'm sure you know somebody. I'm talking to our men. I was so happy to actually have 20 men, hallelujah, Amen. 20 men came for the foot washing today. We almost, we thought we were actually keeping up with the women. I don't know if we did. But I was so glad to see these young men. And I was so glad to have some old men there. We need men. Bible says the greatest one of the um, White says the greatest one of the world is of men who won't be bought or sold.
who in their inmost souls are true to duty as the needle to the pole. We need some men. We're going to stand up and be the leaders in our community to help some young men to actually keep from making the same terrible mistakes as previous generations. We need men. We're going to actually warn them and help them and guide them and direct them. We need, and, and, and secondly, I'm going to make this appeal also to our ladies before we take part in this communion. Communion is all about us actually joining in fellowship with each other with God. Taking of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ symbolically. I'm talking to our ladies. Maybe somebody, some young lady wants to say, Lord, I'm willing to be a mother. I'm willing to be a mother. To a mother, to a fatherless child. I'm willing to be a mother to some child who doesn't really have somebody in their life. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. I'm willing to take time out of my busy schedule also to minister to some young people. Our communities are messed up. And God needs... God needs fathers and mothers. God needs fathers and mothers. As your heads are bowed, your eyes are still closed. Somebody wants to say, Jesus, I hear you. You're still small voice speaking to my heart. Jesus, God, so that we can be adopted into his family. And you want to become a part of the family of God. You want to become a part of the family of God. If that's you, I want you to just raise your hand wherever you're at. You want to just become a part of this family, the family of God. The spirit of the bride say, come, praise God. I see one hand. Somebody else wants to actually raise your hand. Praise God. I see another brother right there. Praise God. If we can get our clerk to actually get the names of those people. We've got two people I see raising their hands. Raise your hands. Keep your hands held high. Raise your hand. You want to become a part of the family of God. Raise your hand. You become part of the family of God. You're adopted. You have a father. If you don't have an earthly father, you have a father in heaven who loves you. I see another. Praise God. A little child shall lead them. Raise your hand. You're saying, Jesus, I want to become a part of your family. Raise your hands high. Raise your hands high. Somebody else wants to say, Lord, I, 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 want, I want you to be my father. I want you to be my father. You're raising your hand saying, Jesus, I want you to be my father. Praise God. Praise God. I see, I see some young people's hands raised. You're saying, Lord, I want you to be my father. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Just keep your hands raised. Keep your hands raised. We want to get your names. Praise God, praise God. Amen, amen. <laughs> I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to actually, I'm going to invite my elders to come and meet me here down here in the front before we pray. We're going to pray to close this and to enter into our communion service. person under the sound of my voice, those who are standing, Lord, who made a commitment. Lord, I pray that you would lead them to some person that they can be a father to, that they can be a mother to, Lord, and use them, Lord, to help to mentor and to pour into the life of that individual, Lord, so that person who, who ultimately would have made some terrible mistakes, Lord, might make some better choices. And as a result of these people standing, we're praying to God that our communities will be transformed and change. Lord, as we get ready to partake in this communion service, we're praying for the Holy Spirit to move even more mightily now than ever before. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You all may be seated.
from another church, we welcome you to partake in our communion service. Uh, we are a welcoming community of faith. As long as you have joined and you're a Christian member of the church, whether our church or another, you're more than welcome to partake of this.
same manner also he took a cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Our Father and our God, we're so thankful that you have set aside this commemoration as well as this cup. And we pray, Lord, that we will accept it and receive it in all the spirit that's involved. We pray, Lord, that we will allow this to become a part of us. And as it becomes a part of our, our nutritional system, it becomes a part of our spiritual nutritional system. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to commemorate this service and remember you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do you use often as you drink it in the remembrance of the children of him. experienced God's goodness since we had communion last, and we want to give you an opportunity to testify of the goodness of Jesus. So I'm just going to give you an opportunity, if there's anybody, we'll give two or three people, just raise your hand, we'll get the mic to you, so you can give a testimony.
So I just decided to go home, but um, they wouldn't pay for my trip to go back home. And I traveled to New Jersey, Neptune City, New Jersey. So I was far from home. And um, they wouldn't pay a ticket for me to catch a bus back home. So I had no choice but to travel to Newark, New Jersey, to get a, a bus home. And um, I looked up online that, you know, they had a 24-hour Greyhound, so I thought I was going to get there. And then, you know, by the time I get there, I could buy me a ticket and wait a couple hours until the next bus was ready. But um, it was closed, so that means I was going to end up having to stay there because I got there at, like, 9 o'clock at night. And it wasn't going to be open until 6 o'clock in the morning. And I didn't want to sleep in the subway, so I was walking, trying to find uh, hotels because they told me that they had like, hotels up the street. And I was um, trying to find a hotel to stay in. But at night, so I was walking literally all night trying to find one, and I couldn't. And when I was walking down this dark road, there was a guy dressed in all black following me. So I was like really scared, walking fast. I was praying like the whole time I was there to keep me safe, let me find somewhere safe to sleep. And um, he kind of got a little bit close to when I finally turned around. He turned the other way. I was like a fire group of people. Like, I heard that we got like by a, a bus stop, and it was people waiting for like a city bus. But um, I finally went down further down this road where I found the hotel, but I didn't like why well, I, I found it, but it was I didn't look in my face. So I had to ask an officer, and the officer was trying to hit on me, trying to get me to get in the car. So I was like, no, like just like, easily running off. And then I found the hotel, and I finally was um, safe for the night. You know, I had somewhere to sleep. Woke up in the morning, traveled. Um, back to the bus station, you know, my, my bus. And the whole time, I mean, like, I was praying, but I was like, please, I don't know where I'm, where I'm going, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'm traveling from Newark, New Jersey, trying to get back to Pensacola. So, we traveled, like, through a lot of cities. It took me two days to get home. And um, on the bus, I accidentally missed, like, I got off on one stop, and I was crying. I was on the phone with my mom. I was like, Mom, I don't know where I'm at. Like, I'm scared. I'm in a, a, a city, like, a subway where they got trains. I was like, just panicking, but um, she, was, she was like, you know, just breathe, calm down, see if there's somebody around that knows when the bus, the next bus or train comes. And you know, I did that. They, the man that I spoke to, he was getting on the same train as me, so then I ended up getting on the train and going further to where I'm supposed to go, the place that I got to, which was um, North Carolina. We had to stop there, but it was delayed, so we were there for like two hours, like starving. The food was like sky high, and Mind you, this, I was on a budget because I only had like maybe three hundred dollars left in my name, so I had to pay for the bus, I had to pay like a hotel, and I had to pay for a train ticket to get home. So my, my money was limited, but um, I ended up getting home safely. You know, I told I told everybody what was going on, and my nana. When I told my nana, you know, she was very mad with me because I didn't let her know. But I was like, you know, I was trying to be, you know, in my grown woman business, trying to do stuff to provide for my son, and um, she was just like, well, you know. I'm glad that you prayed because Newark, Newark, New Jersey is really the biggest crime city and has the most unsolved murders. She said, so she was like, for me to be in that city by myself, walking like at night, I could, I shouldn't have been dead by then. So that's my testimony that you know, he kept me safe that whole time. Praise the Lord, praise God, praise God. That's a serious testimony. Amen. I know, I know God's with you. Amen. 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 Praise God. Yeah. We want to sing a song. Um, how many of y'all looking forward to going to heaven? Raise your hand. Will we all get to heaven? That's going to be a day of rejoicing, won't it? Yeah. Will we all see Jesus? Yeah. We're going to sing and shout the victory. Number 633. Let's all stand together as we sing. 633. Will we all get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing.
close, we want to thank the Lord. Some people raised their hands. We want to just let, we want to hear what the Lord has done through these people. All right, we have Nathaniel Harris. He is desiring baptism, prayer, Bible study. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for Brother Harris being with us. And, and at this time, we're going to just close our heads and close our eyes. Excuse me. Close our heads. I need to get some sleep. Close our eyes and bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard. Lord, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. We give him the glory, the honor, and the praise to God. We thank you to God that we're cleansed, we're, we're, we're purified, and we're praying to God that, Lord, you would just give us the, the power. As we said earlier, to go and sin no more. I'm praying to God that you use each person here this day, Lord, to be a witness, uh, to help somebody be drawn closer to the Savior. Lord, as we leave this place, may we never leave your presence. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his peace both now and forevermore. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. 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 Please be seated for a moment of silent meditation. And I'm going to ask for our elders uh, in a little bit to meet me here to my left, to your right, and we want to talk to you just briefly. There will be a trash can at the back. We're also taking the love off from you as you leave. Um, to let, you know, for, for those who are in need. So we wish you guys a blessing. 